All right, thank you very much for coming everyone. So almost another full house for a uh, Compass event. So my name's Dr. Ben Neville and I'm the Program Director of Compass, so the Australian Impact Entrepreneurship Program. Um, before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional owners of this land. I'd also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, masterclass event of uh, 2016. So Compass exists to both to, to inspire and raise awareness about creating social and environmental impact through entrepreneurship. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. Mark Daniels is the Head of Market and Sector Development at Social Traders. So for those of you who don't know, Social Traders is a specialist social enterprise development organisation acting in many ways as the peak body uh, of the sector in Victoria and Australia. They support the development of sustainable social enterprises in a lot of different ways, including running their accelerator program, The Crunch, which I mentioned just before. Mark's the perfect person to present our first uh, masterclass. When I first began preparing for uh, the subject I teach on social entrepreneurship, about six or seven years ago, I was told by uh, James Murphy, who uh, owns Kerry Kerry, which um, used to be uh, um, House of Cards, he told me to go along to Social Traders and do Mark's Social Entrepreneurship 101 class. And so that was incredibly informative and engaging and since then Mark's been sort of top of our list for de delivering a, a masterclass. Mark has wide-ranging experience in social enterprise across program, advocacy, policy and, and project development. Prior to joining Social Traders in 2008, he was Social Enterprise Manager for the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, managing a number of social enterprises aimed at assisting people into mainstream employment, as well as providing expertise to other agencies looking to establish social enterprises. Now as the Head of Market and Sector Development, Mark plays a key role in developing new markets for social enterprises through encouraging large corporations and government to engage in social procurement. In hopefully uh, uh, the, the University of Melbourne with the Sustainability Charter just passed. I think that will be um, a great leg up for that. He also works with social enterprises to build capacity in winning contracts and finding customers, including through the online f uh, finder platform that um, social traders operate. So please uh, all welcome Mark to speak to us tonight on a new breed of business, the Australian social enterprise. Hi. Great. Nice to see the size of the room, the number of people here. It's fantastic. Um, my name's Mark Daniels. I work for Social Traders. Um, we're just organising something, but um, I am going to get started anyway. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's uh, really exciting to see what Ben has um, sort of persistently pursued and created here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to spend uh, probably about half an hour talking to you about uh, the evolution of social enterprise in Australia um, and then I'm really going to throw it open to you to pin me down with some questions, things that are interesting to you or that you care about that you want to raise with me. Um, I guess the first thing is my organisation, Ben's mentioned it, I'll mention it again. Um, social Traders is a purpose-built social enterprise development organisation. We were the first and we cover a really broad span of activities. We're about 14 people, just to give you a size of scale. We're based in Melbourne on, Spring Street, on uh, Exhibition Street. And we've got three key objectives. And those key objectives are to grow the viability uh, value uh, uh, of social enterprise. So we try and make social enterprises more investable. And we do that by working one-on-one -on -one with your team if you're seeking to develop a social enterprise and we, uh, we incubate your idea basically. So we work with you, you do all the work, but we provide the frameworks and the structure around the work which you do. And our goal in that is really to make your social enterprise as investable as possible. The second priority here is growing the visibility voice and value of social enterprise. So what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, Ben alluded to being a peak. There is no real peak for social enterprise in Australia. 
but I guess we're as good as it gets in some ways. We're a service organisation. We, you know, we, we actually deliver a whole range of services. But you know, what social enterprise really needs is to be front and centre, getting media attention on a regular basis, getting data and research out into the public domain so people can understand it, running events that recognise it and building the community that is the social enterprise community in Australia. And then the third one here is around opening new government and corporate markets. And this is really uh, a key area for me. In fact, the first and third are, are, are my responsibility in the organisation. And new government and corporate markets for us, uh, you know, there are two ways that you can scale a social enterprise. Well, there are many ways you can scale it, but, but, but two in particular. One is that you invest and grow it and make it a scalable business from the outset. And, and that the amount of capital you can drive into that business allows it to scale to the size that it needs to be. Another element of this is, I guess, to look at the demand side and drive, use demand to drive the growth of social enterprises. So we're really focused on unlocking big wads of um, contract. And the biggest contracts sit with governments and corporate businesses in Australia. And they traditionally are, are structurally not aligned to buying from a social enterprise. They buy from big companies. Uh, that's who their clients are. And what we've been working on for the last four or five years is working with those institutions and organisations to get them to think differently about how they buy, to start to see that value can be a lot more than just getting the cheapest price that you can get something delivered for. You can actually create a whole lot of added value by delivering social value on top of the, uh, the goods and services that you're purchasing as well. So there are three platforms for us. I don't think this video is going to work, um, it's, but it may. Let me try. The world is a great place, but unfortunately, too many people are caught in a cycle of disadvantage. And that hurts us all. But people everywhere do want to help. Every year, more and more people are choosing to start businesses where the aim is to achieve social good, rather than simply maximising personal profit. These are social enterprises, and whether their key motivation is to create employment for the disadvantaged, provide access to essential products and services, or to redistribute profits to fund a social cause, we're out to help and support them. Social Traders is Australia's leading social enterprise development organisation. We work with social enterprises to break the cycle of disadvantage in Australia and to build resilience in Australian communities. We do this by supporting social enterprises to start up, grow and thrive and reach their full potential. We are the only organisation to offer a full suite of services to social enterprises in Australia. Business support, access to capital and development of market opportunities, plus we represent social enterprises through industry activities such as the Social Enterprise Awards and the Social Enterprise Masters Conference. We think social enterprises are the most effective way to harness the marketplace to tackle disadvantage in Australia. And that is why we exist. That's our slick commercial stuff. Um, and uh, I, I, I kind of like it, but uh, I feel like it should be a bit jazzier. You know, it's not as funky and edgy as social enterprise should be. Um, having said that, let me kick on. Why do I believe in social enterprise? Well, my background is in um, public housing. So I used to work on a public housing estate. That's it. Uh, if you ever go to uh, Fitzroy, and I'm sure a lot of people at Melbourne Uni would, uh, Corner of Gertrude and Brunswick Street, four high-rise towers, uh, Atherton Gardens public housing estate was where I worked for uh, eight years. And this high-rise estate is, um, uh, when I started working there in 2000, was defined, was, 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 without doubt, the worst public housing estate in Victoria. In fact, uh, they talked about the Beirut end of Brunswick Street, which was basically where this was. Um, I didn't see any bullets in the building, but I'm sure there was, if you look closely enough. Uh, and, and what we had was a, we had a heroin epidemic in this estate. We were collecting 2,000 syringes a month on this estate, let alone what was walking off this estate. We had, um, uh, we had 25% annual turnover, so every four years the whole community left and was replaced. We had 95% uh, uh, joblessness and we had 125 vacant properties and there was a waiting list of 40,000 people to get into public housing at the time. So people would rather be homeless 
than living in this place. That was basically the message. And we did a whole range of interventions at the time. We did, uh, we increased security. We put a security guard 24 seven in the base of every tower. We had uh, entry, swipe card entry. We made it, we did a lot of target hardening. We did uh, community development work. We upgraded the assets. So most of the flats on that, 800 flats on that estate, nearly all of them have been upgraded since uh, 2000. And uh, so we're doing all these things and it stabilised the community. So it went from an absolute basket case to a community that was dysfunctional, but uh, we weren't having shootings very often, we weren't having stabbings very often, we weren't having homicides very often on the estate. People still were scared. The role models in the, in the community were the drug dealers because they're the ones that drove the Mercedes and the BMWs and they're the ones that you can make 100 bucks from very easily if you wanted to run drugs. And this is a family estate. So most of the people living here were under 20 years old. So that was their experience of growing up. And we said, how can we take this to the next level? And one of the things we looked at was our spend. As a government department, what we were spending on this particular estate. In fact, we looked at across Fitzroy and Collingwood, the two high-rise high estates. And what we found was that we were spending $6 million a year on these two estates. And we weren't employing any tenants. So every day, our money walked off that estate. And we looked at the jobs, and it was security, cleaning, and maintenance. All entry-level jobs. So we took our cleaning contract that was coming up. It was about a million-dollar cleaning contract. had about 30 positions in that contract. And we wrote into the contract that 35% of the labour force must be public housing tenants from the Fitzroy or Collingwood high-rise estate. And overnight, that contract was awarded to a private company and they employed 15 public housing tenants and our jobless rate went from 95% to 92% overnight. One shift in policy and we had moved unemployment 3% in that community. It was quite profound. And then we started to see, well, what else can we do? So we looked at the security contract on the estate. And the security contract was massive. It was $4 million across Fitzroy and Collingwood because we had 24-7 in seven towers. Plus, we had a roving crew of four. So we had basically 11 security guards 24-7 on these estates. And we started to work with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, who are directly opposite the Fitzroy estate. And they said to us, because they were the job, I don't even know what the job network or Job Services Australia is called now, it keeps changing its name, but they were the employment services provider for unemployed people. And they said, we've got tons of your tenants who are unemployed and on our books. And every year they have to go and do training. They are mutually obligated to go and do some training programs. And so they come down out of their flats and they do these training courses which go for about four or five weeks. And over that period of time they get quite motivated because you know, the training's delivered really well, they get excited, and then they start applying for jobs. In the last week or two they're applying for jobs. And they get knocked back after knocked back because most of them haven't worked in over five years. And then they finish their training they haven't gotten a job, they go back to their flats and they sit there for the next 48 weeks. I'm not saying literally sit there, but they're, they're, they're locked to their properties because they don't have a job to go to. And then they go and do their mutual obligation again. And so the Brotherhood said to us, what we'd really like to do is get your security contract during the day hours between 8am and 4pm. And we'd like to run it as a concierge service. So think New York, think high rise buildings, you know, billion dollar buildings. Uh, with uh, someone who cares about who lives in that tower, working in the base, knows everyone who lives in there, and they, they care about them, and they take care of them, they do interpreting for them, translating, they refer them to local services that can assist them, and so on and so on. And we thought this was a fantastic idea, and they said, we're going to catch the people after done their pre-employment training, and we're going to give them jobs, because they're ready, but their CV says they're not ready, but we know they're ready. And then we're going to hold them in that job for 12 months, and then at the end, Pardon me, at nine months or so, we're going to pathway them into another job in the open labour market. So we're going to create this pipeline, a sausage machine of people who are public housing tenants who are unemployed, who will go through this business and then leave and get a job in the open labour market. And they created it and we enabled it. And it was called the, it is still operating. This was 2004 it started. It was called the Community Contact Service. It's got another name now. And every year, 12 tenants came into this business. And after three years, we evaluated it, and 80% of the p 
people who'd started went on to get jobs in the open labour market, long-term unemployed people whose lives had been changed. And when they worked there, they had a supportive workplace, they did a certificate level qualification, so they were doing a certificate three in community services, and they were building a work history. Three things they didn't have previously, they now have when they, when they did their 12 month um, spell with us. And you know, the runs were on the board. 80% of these people were getting jobs, whereas the market previously said none of them were ready to work. And we assessed it, and, and in 2008, I stopped working in this community. I'd gone on to manage that social enterprise, the community contact service, and started a few others, a cleaning company, and a uh, street cleaning we did in the city of Yarra, and also a, a landscaping business. And when I left this estate, we went from um, a vacancy, we had 125 vacant properties, I said before, in 2008, there was a six-year waiting list to get into this estate. We'd gone from 25% annual turnover to 10% annual turnover. So that was consistent with the rest of the city of Yarra, where this estate was based. We'd gone from collecting 2,000 syringes a month to collecting 400 syringes a month. You can't get rid of um, heroin, but you can control it to some extent. But most profoundly, we went from 95% joblessness to 81% joblessness. Just to give you a sense, because they're still high numbers. Only about 30% of those people in that whole community are on Newstart. The rest are on age pensions, they're on disability support pensions. So 70% of that community is deemed never to work. Only 30% of that community could work, and of that 30%, only we got 19% uh, of that 30% to work. We had the highest employment rate of any public housing estate in Australia. And to give you another sense, on each floor we used to have one flat where there was someone who worked. One flat, one out of ten. Oh no, it was on every two floors, sorry, get my maths right. So we had one flat on every two floors where someone worked. And when, we, when I finished there in 2008, we had two flats on every floor where someone worked. It was such a significant shift in the sense of community. And what that made me really conscious of is that the market can generate all sorts of social change. We changed our procurement, had nothing to do with social enterprise, but that was profound. But when we created social enterprise, that really blew my mind. Because that moved 95 to 81%. That activity alone People started to see other people I knew working. That whole sense of uh, confidence and capability and desire to work started to grow in that community. <coughs> and so that really led me on a path where I said, I'm really, really fascinated by social enterprise and I'm really fascinated by the role of the market in addressing social issues because it's profound. And we're only scraping the surface of the market at this stage. There's $500 billion spent in procurement every year. That's how big the market is for social impact that we're not yet touching, okay? So I just wanted to give you a context of where I come from. And you know, so when I'm telling you statistics, you don't just go, who is this academic uh, type person who's telling me statistics? I, I've come from a place where I'm quite fascinated by this because I've been captured by the possibilities of social enterprise. All right, so what is social enterprise? I think we need to get the definition right from the outset. This is a definition that we use. It's a definition that the centre that was developed by the Queensland University of Technology and it's now a very broadly accepted definition of what social enterprise is. It has three key elements. That fundamentally the first element is that you are driven by public or community benefit not personal profit public or community benefit is your key reason for existing <coughs> second that you sell stuff and that sales is the majority of the income of your business so we're not talking about welfare here okay so you can't just be a not-for-profit and say I'm a social enterprise you have to sell stuff if you're a not-for-profit but you don't have to be a not-for-profit either you can be a for-profit because in this third element you need to reinvest the majority of your profit or surplus in the mission for which you're established. So we don't care what company form you adopt, as long as you commit 
and demonstrate that you're reinvesting the majority of your profits in the mission for which you're established. So they're, in a, they're, they're uh, beyond question for us. This is how we determine who we work with in the crunch. This is how we determine who we invest in. We actually certify social enterprises to get onto our um, procurement platform. And this is the definition that we use. We need to cite evidence of these things. Other people will have different definitions. This is a pretty broadly accepted one though. And I just want to touch on a spectrum of social enterprise. And the spectrum really is just to capture, uh, I guess, some of the elements of what I just spoke about. I mean, traditionally, we do have community welfare organisations that generally aren't trading entities. They're dependent on philanthropy or government um, funding or grants and so forth. And then you get into not-for-profits that run, have some social enterprising activity, but it doesn't constitute 50% of their, uh, it's not the majority of their income. And then you hit social enterprise that meets the sweet spot of those three criteria that I've outlined. And then out the other side, you start to get you know, good companies would be my description of them. B Corps uh, often fit into this domain. Uh, uh, and they're businesses that are doing, the social or ethical businesses, they're doing really good stuff, but they don't meet our definition of social enterprise. That doesn't diminish what they're achieving. They're just not social enterprises. And finally, you end up with mainstream commercial businesses. So that's just, I guess, an interesting schematic for you to take in as well. And the other thing, and I'll stop contexting all of this, but I think it's important to kick it off, is that we see social enterprises having three fundamental motivations. Nearly every social enterprise will fit into one of these three. And one is that they exist, so the first bucket or motivation, and I'll just to be really clear, most of them only have one motivation. In fact, the more motivations they pick up, the more susceptible they are to failure from our perspective. So one is around employment and training for marginalised groups. So bringing people back into the labour market that wouldn't otherwise be in it. And that's generally the one that we most know. You know, it is the streets, it is the big issues, it is, uh, you know, I could list hundreds of them. Uh, disability organisations that employ people with disabilities, so on and so on. And there are lots of them and they're really complex businesses to run because you have productivity deficits, you're working with a disadvantaged cohort and that's your workforce. The second, but they're fantastic. The second is community need. And this is basically saying that sometimes there is a need not being met by the marketplace. So why do we have community childcare centres? Why did Bendigo Community Bank develop? Why, why there are a whole range of social enterprises that have been developed in response to a market failure in some way. So Good Start was one of those. Google it if you haven't seen it before, it's quite profound. ABC Childcare Centres was one of the biggest childcare companies in the world, went under in the global financial crisis and four organisations came together, four not-for-profit organisations came together and they bought out part of ABC which is around six to 700 childcare centres they took on. And they did that because there was going to be a massive problem in the market. There were about 70,000 kids being taken care in these uh, childcare centres. But more to the point, profoundly for them, a not-for-profit organisation who cares about how people grow up would absolutely want to be there the day that they went into childcare, influencing their future opportunities for the next five years, because we, you know, traditionally know that most of the developmental, uh, most development occurs in the first five years of your life anyway. So they wanted to be there to make sure that the future of Australia actually was getting the best start that they could possibly get as well. But they responded to a market failure, and there are so many community childcare centres, community aged care providers community training organisations that are responding because the market isn't meeting a particular need. And the third element here is about profit redistribution. And some of the sexiest, most uh, well-known social enterprises fit into this definition. Who gives a crap? Thank you. Are really good examples of social enterprises that exist to make money so that they can invest it into development programs in other countries. One of the most obvious ones that we're all exposed to are op, op shops. There's over 10,000 op shops in Australia, just to give you a sense. And op shops are in this bucket and they exist to make money so they can invest them back into community programs. So just to give you a schematic, again, this is generally what a social enterprise motivation is. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, a bit of data on social enterprise and, um, and then I'm going to give you some um, thoughts, reflections over the, uh, the journey of, of what seems to be happening in social enterprise in Australia. We did some research with Queensland University of Technology called Finding Australia Social Enterprise Sector in 2010. We also did some in 2015 and we're about to release in June the 2016 version of this. So there'll be a whole updated data set on social enterprise in Australia. I'm not going to go through the whole research for, with you, but I do want to just point out a few really interesting stats. Uh, we, we had about three, roughly around 300 uh, social enterprises who completed a survey. And what was really interesting for me in particular was the breakdown of small, medium and large businesses. So this is uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics definition. Uh, a large business has over 200 employees and, and there are a whole other set of criteria that runs into this, but just to give you the ballpark, medium's over 20, small's under 20 basically. And what we found was that most social enterprises are small. There was a smaller number of medium and there was a small number of large. When you put uh, private businesses against social enterprises, you almost have an exact copy of that chart. So you pretty much had the same number of small, medium and large as a percentage. So what that was saying to us, which was really profound, is that social enterprise really aren't that different to normal businesses. That they actually don't have barriers to growth that prevent them from, from growing. They can become large organisations, just like private companies can become large organisations. So they're not that different, fundamentally. And then what we found was, we said, what industry do you work in? And the industries that were really dominant are not areas that you traditionally think of social enterprises being in. But most arts organisations are actually social enterprises. And most education and training organisations are social enterprises. And then we had uh, uh, other domains that were really interesting, like, um, I know retail's in here as well, and that's the op shop. So just to give you a snapshot, there was some really interesting data coming out, though, about where the dominant industries were as well. And they weren't necessarily where you thought they were. But, but beautifully, they, they do operate in every industry. So we could find, out of a sample of 300, evidence of social enterprises that operate in every industry, including mining. And that was such a pleasure for us to find out. We had our survey open for three months, and on the last day, an Aboriginal mining social enterprise filled in uh, the data set. So we had the complete deck of cards and we we're ecstatic about that. So they can operate in any industry. And I guess just a summation of some other data that was captured in phases. Lots of the social enterprises are not young. More than 73% of respondents have been trading for at least five years and 62% for more than 10. So this term social enterprise is very new. In fact, it's probably only 15 years old, the term social enterprise. But the term social enterprise was used as an umbrella to capture a whole range of organisations that already existed and a whole range of intentions and directions that were uh, potentially going to occur moving forward as well. It's pretty diverse, so you've just seen the range of industries. It's very innovative and we had evidence in the research of the level of innovation that was occurring in social enterprises. And the fact that they've been operating for so long suggests they're really sustainable businesses. In fact, they were more sustainable than most private companies. That was sort of the evidence that we were coming up with as well as a, a through the phases sample that we had. Now, I just want to run some stuff by you that you may not know. So 37% of all income in the not-for-profit sector is earned. This is the biggest income stream in the not-for-profit sector in Australia. Government is only about 20%. Philanthropy is about 10%. So most of what happens in the not-for-profit sector is trade. And you know, when you think about aged care, childcare, all those sorts of things, you can see it. I'm not going to obsess with um, not-for-profits, but that's where the best data is. The best data is in here because we cannot, we cannot track for-profit social enterprises in any public domain because they're impossible. There is no category, there's no business form called social enterprise. So we don't know what they're doing, but we can, we can from the not-for-profit data. As soon as we see trading not-for-profits, we can conclude that they're social enterprises. What else do we know? 
Social enterprise activity is about 2 to 3% of GDP. It's not insignificant. One of the problems we have is that many of these organisations don't know their social enterprises or they don't identify with the term. So they'll say, we're a housing provider or we're an aged care provider. They won't see themselves as social enterprises. That's not really a problem, <coughs> but it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting sort of uh, uh, data collection issue that we face. We think there's about 20,000 social enterprises. This was based on the 210 data. 20,000 operating in Australia and there was some research done indicating that they, the researchers felt it had grown by 37% over five years from about 2009 to 2014. They employ over 300,000 Australians and I guess this point is really important to communicate too. There is no government strategy for social enterprise in Australia, so it's, it operates within a policy vacuum. There are policies within particular domains like, you know, I don't want to keep using aged care and childcare, but I will for the sake of um, consistency. But it's not like anyone has ever said, let's create a social enterprise strategy. What do they need? How do we enable it? So we don't have a supportive government framework or policy in Australia for this to occur. And what we're about to see is something transformational in this space. And that's the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And if you don't know about it and you're interested in this space, have a look. Because $22 billion a year of marketplace is about to open up to anyone who chooses to go into that market moving forward. And so what's basically happening in NDIS is that organisations that traditionally got money from government to deliver disability services are now not going to get money from government. The money will go to the consumer and the consumer will choose who they buy from. That's profound. And so if you're a not-for-profit disability organisation who wants to exist in that marketplace, you have to become a social enterprise because you've now got to sell to consumers. You are not selling to government grants anymore. It's a fundamental shift from being grant funded and an allocated uh, cohort of people given to you versus I have to sell my services to anyone I can sell them to. So we're going to see 37% ramp up to over 50%. No question. Because 22 billion is about to open up to the whole marketplace. And lastly on this point, we will continue to see government reform in service delivery and contracting and that will generate the most social enterprise activity. Government has the greatest levers to do this. There's no question. But I don't want to obsess about government and I don't want to obsess about the not-for-profit sector either. I just want to give you a few other pictures. This is the way that or the sector organises itself at the moment. So there is no peak in social enterprise in Australia. We've had a few... Uh, uh, unfunded peaks emerge, so one in Queensland, uh, there's a Tasmanian social enterprise network, there's social traders, but I guess all that means is there's no natural organisation that occurs within the sector. It doesn't do it uh, around a peak. And the second point is that, that, that there are networks that do form sometimes around cohorts or missions. So all of the disability organisations form around uh, the fact that they employ people with disabilities. You may not know this, but 20,000 people with disabilities are employed through these organisations. And they, they're worth well over a billion dollars um, in terms of turnover. So they're quite significant players. But what happens most commonly is that social enterprise networks form along industry lines. So things like Surf Life Saving Australia, you'd be really surprised to, to, to know this, but Surf Life Saving Clubs, particularly in the northern states, are some of the biggest social enterprises in Australia. And they fit our definition beautifully. Uh, so Community Newspaper Association, the Community Broadcasting Association, the Community Recycling Network. So there are natural coming togethers of social enterprise. But what matters to these organisations is not so much just that they're a social enterprise, but also the industry that they operate in, which is a really obvious point, I guess. And there's a growing number of organisations like ours as well. And I'm going to show you some of them and how they've emerged over the last few years as well. And finally, social enterprise is on a wave at the moment. And it really started about 15 years ago. And it started with um, 
um, Tony Blair in the UK. He was probably the great political leader of social enterprise of this wave. Um, it's kind of consistent with Cool Britannia at the time. Uh, he had friends who ran social enterprises. Social enterprise became part of his policy platform in the late 1990s and carried right through his whole, um, his whole uh, uh, political career. So he created a whole range of responses to inequality and social enterprise was one of the fundamental levers in the way that he responded to inequality. So this group that's emerged in the 21st century really follows on from a whole range of other waves of social enterprise activity. And so some of those waves have been driven by economic necessity or alternative culture. Uh, and in the 90s, we've seen job creation. So, I mean, I won't point it out, but we have mutuals and associations that were started 150 years ago. RACV is one of those. Uh, NRMA is one of those. Uh, a lot of our super funds and life insurance organisations were social enterprises at some point in their history. And they did that because uh, aggregating and collect uh, collective behaviour was the only way they could create the institutions that society actually needed at the time. The second big wave was in the 60s where we had alternative culture and that ran through the 70s as well where people actually wanted to do things differently and they wanted to do communal activities again. And social enterprise and particularly cooperatives at that time were a fundamental part of that um, notion. And then in the 90s, we really saw this new type of social enterprise emerging, which was around creating jobs, using social enterprise as a way of addressing disadvantage through job creation. And the whole way through this, you had op shops and the churches involved, that never changed. And in the 21st century iteration, I think there are two really strong elements. There's the community sector, and then there are these no bullshit realists in rural and regional Australia who go, we've got a problem, how are we going to solve it? Because government's not going to dig us out. We're a small rural town of 800 households, government is not going to fix the fact that our petrol station's just gone broke. What are we going to do about it? So we have seen a, a plethora of community buyouts and social enterprise in rural and regional Australia that we've never seen before. Bendigo Community Bank has more community bank branches than it does Bendigo Bank branches. And their community bank branches, every one of them is a social enterprise. And there's about 280 across rural, regional and in some cases metropolitan Australia. But my favourite is the Yakandanda Community Development Company where the petrol station went broke, the community developed a vision for it, they ran a community share float, they raised $400,000, they rebuilt the petrol station and it went from losing $500 a week to making $500 a week. And half the town owned the petrol station. So it went from doing 10,000 litres a week to doing 35,000 litres a week. And when you've got a stake in it, the likelihood of it succeeding or you buying from it is much greater. So sometimes it works when it's a social enterprise where it doesn't work if it's a private business. That collectivism is central. And the last, the, the other point on this is, the other group coming through are, are you, most of you anyway, I know there are not all Gen Ys in the audience, but there's a few of you. Um, and you guys, I bring a completely different value set and you know um, Ben was talking about James Murphy at Kerry Kerry. James epitomises uh, Gen Y for me. He, he basically said I want to set up a social enterprise that give, gives back and he did it as his, as his third year social work um, assignment and he built Kerry Kerry because he could see a way that this stuff could happen. And we're just seeing it time and time again. You think of the most high, pro high profile social enterprise at the moment they are all run by Gen Ys. So your value system is actually driving the re-emergence of social enterprise. Maybe it's a bit like the 60s again, without the free love, of course, but uh, you know, maybe we're seeing a whole new generation coming through with the same cooperative values that we saw in the 60s and 70s. 
And the other is it's coming out of those people who are fed up with a corporate machine. So we're actually seeing a whole lot of people who are saying, I don't want to work for Macquarie Bank anymore. I actually want to turn my banking skills or my social investments, my investment skills to social investment now. I want to do something different. So past, past waves have ended abruptly, but what we're seeing in this wave is, I keep saying we're about halfway up the wave. I said that eight years ago, and I still don't feel like we're any closer to the top of the wave. So there's a lot of upside. I don't see this going away at any stage. And of course, the other factor in all this that was critical was the financial crisis in 2008. So that really got people thinking very differently about their values and what they wanted to see moving forward. And they didn't want to see more of the same. They didn't want to see the economy, uh, the whole economic system being driven by bankers fundamentally. It's not that social enterprises stopped that, but it's providing an alternative view. It's suggesting or imagining an alternative economy moving forwards. And that's what is, I think has helped people to latch on to this. Some of the other trends and patterns that were emerging. Um, research, we work with Australia Post really closely and they did a bit of research into consumer behaviour. And they found that general public don't actually recognise the term social enterprise and they don't understand it. In fact, in a survey of over 100 people, not even one person could, under, could articulate what a social enterprise was effectively. Um, even one person who worked in a social enterprise couldn't explain what it was. <laughs> I know that feeling. Once told the definition of social enterprise, they were still confused and they kept thinking that pink caps on Mount Franklin water bottles could have been a social enterprise, potentially. And what we also found when we accessed research being done in other places is that um, about 12% of the marketplace actually care and buy based on their values. And then about 40%, uh, so you've got your leaders and then you've got your leaners. This 40% will buy on values if they're given good information on it, but they don't seek it out as keenly as the leaders do. And then you've got 50% of the market who doesn't care, quite simply. Another pattern or trend, and I mentioned this before, social procurement. This is a profound emerging trend in social enterprise at the moment, but it goes beyond social enterprise. It can be around indigenous procurement. It can be about uh, local content in contracts, so making sure that a rural area benefits from um, um, any tendering processes that are occurring there. And what lies at the heart of this, I guess, is the concept that you can buy beyond the goods and services that you're purchasing. So for us, it's about the greatest untapped tool of social change being $500 billion of procurement spend in Australia. That is the money that we can start to access and start to use to solve a whole range of social issues that we can't possibly imagine solving at the moment because there is not enough money to do it. Just to use one example on this, Rio Tinto, and you can laugh at the irony of mining companies being the leaders in this space, but nonetheless, they are. Rio Tinto has, uh, was spending $2.4 billion a year in Western Australia in the Pilbara of their procurement spend with Indigenous businesses. That's 30% of all their procurement went to Indigenous businesses. Now my point would be, there is no government program that's ever been constructed that could deliver the same impact as $2.4 billion of procurement spend with Indigenous business. You could not create that many jobs for Indigenous people. It's, it's, it's not normal. You've got to soak them up and you needed the businesses to soak them up. And the last trend I'm going to touch on and I'll finish in a tick is impact investing. So this is a really big shift. Some people are really excited about it. I'm moderately excited about it. But impact investing is this whole new space of saying we can, we can invest in something and we can get a social return and a financial return. And it's being mooted through things like social impact bonds, so bonds that deliver a social impact, but we're also seeing it in people who want to invest in social enterprise. And if you were listening to Pamela Hardigan's conversation, I'm sure she touched on the social investment market. It's one of the hottest it's sucking a lot of air out of the uh, market uh, at the moment in terms of discussion, but I think it's a really important development that we're actually starting to see social enterprise and social impact as a product that can actually be invested in and it can deliver returns, not just financial returns, but social returns as well. And there are some people who, go, who are appalled by that and there are some people who are very excited by that.
because it will unleash more social change. There's no question. And lastly, I just want to touch on this. We did uh, research in 2015 with now Jo, jo Barraquette, the same one at QUT, but she's now at the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne. And we went and talked to about 80 different social enterprises and we said, what are the five big issues and opportunities that you can see? And what they came up with was social procurement is the biggest, issue, biggest opportunity, no question. We've got to change the way government and corporates buy and then we, would, we will scale our businesses and deliver huge amounts of impact. Governance and staff is a huge challenge. And that challenge is basically driven by the fact that you want, you want a board member and staff member who understand business and social. And those two skill sets don't often come in the board members and the staff that you're seeking. And sometimes you don't want both, but this is the challenge that social enterprises were talking about. Something's always compromised and they weren't necessarily happy with how those compromises were made. The third one's around partnering. They, the social enterprises see a huge opportunity in partnerships, partnering with each other and partnering with corporates and with government. Particularly corporates, that's where the real opportunity is from their perspective. We'll scale our businesses by partnering with um, other organisations. Social finance, that was an issue and it was the suitability of the finance. So the social enterprise we were talking to was saying, so we love social finance as a concept, but the products they're putting in the market aren't suitable for our organisations at this stage. And lastly, there was a big opportunity around coordinated advocacy. As I said before, there is no peak, there is no organised voice for social enterprise. What if we created it? How much impact could we have collectively? I just want to, this is social traders, and I just want to finish on this note. If you are an aspirational social enterprise, we have a terrific program called The Crunch. It uh, starts recruiting in the back half of this year and I'm sure it'll dovetail beautifully into um, what Ben's developing here as well. And, and I think that's the intention, Ben, that, that what comes out of uh, Melbourne Uni, uh, some of them will really be suited to The Crunch. And The Crunch is a six month intensive process where you are supported to take an idea and hopefully, uh, you know, coming out of this program, a more robust idea and take it up to investment readiness. And we surround you with mentors, uh, program managers, and um, we even have MBA students from Melbourne Business School working with you on that. Uh, and so you're really heavily resourced and supported, but you have to make the time to actually develop the business plan and then eventually pitch to us for investment and we bring other investors into the room as well who um, invest in social enterprises. And then those that get investment from us go into our portfolio and they continue to be supported to, by us until they repay our loan, which can be for up to seven years.